cool kids. Fuck the kids? Yeah. You have just tuned in to the Mag Nerd Podcast. Your home for everything in music, anime, and gaming. What is up, guys? Show Enough the King here, back with another episode of the Mag Nerd Podcast. This will be episode 24. God damn. We got a great show for you guys today. Uh, today's episode, we will be talking about uh, PlayStation 5. You know, Sony is being dirty once again. You know, they are trying to block Game Pass. Could it be that they're intimidated? We're going to talk about it. Uh, we're going to also do some uh, reviews today. I'm going to talk about She-Hulk. It premiered last Wednesday on Disney+. Plus. I'm going to talk about the good and the bad. Um, I also want to review a couple of movies. Um, I saw two movies this weekend. Um, I saw Black Phone and I saw Day Shift, a, a movie on Netflix. So we'll be talking about that. And in anime slash manga news, I will be talking about Dragon Ball Super Chapter 87, as well as refer and talking about uh, the Dragon Ball Superhero movie that just premiered in the United States over the weekend. And uh, we'll talk about uh, how much money that um, thing made. And again, and the last part is, I want to talk about Bleach. You know, um, there were some rumors that Bleach would be exclusively streamed on Disney+. Plus, So uh, I will be talking about that as well. So guys, we've got a great show for you. And uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get into the nerdly news. All right, so first segment in the nerdly news, we're going to talk about things that are not necessarily uh, in music, anime, or gaming. This is just kind of like my whole in, in all-encompassing things, the things I want to talk about. Uh, so the uh, first thing I want to talk about is uh, two movies that I watched this weekend. Um, the first one was Day Shift. Uh, this was a movie that stars Jamie Foxx, and it also has uh, uh, James DeFranco's brother in it. Um, I was bored this weekend just, you know, trying to catch up on a lot of uh, movies since I didn't have as much anime to watch. So I decided to watch Night Shift. And boy, oh boy, was I surprised at how much I enjoyed that movie. Now, again, let me be clear. It is not a, like, Oscar-nominated kind of film. Like, and again, I hate how people treat films like if it's not Oscar bait or if it's not, like... A Marvel cinematic uh, movie that it doesn't have any real merit, but again, I really endure, enjoyed Day Shift. Uh, what I enjoyed about it the most was the action. Like, the action in that movie was top notch. Like, again, if you guys are not familiar with Scott Atkins, uh, he has a scene about the midway point of this film where uh, Jamie Foxx's character and uh, James DeFranco's brother, and I'll have to figure out his name, so I'm not calling him James Franco's brother the entire time. Uh, they're clearing out this house and uh they're clearing it out with, and, and, and again well i'm sorry I, I let me let me let me back up a little bit so day shift is a movie about hunting vampires so the main the main protagonist is jamie fox he is a hard-working vampire hunter who is trying to provide a uh, living for his you know estranged wife and daughter and the estranged wife is played by megan good who could lord that woman is fine like i mean i was in love with uh megan good since roll bounce but you know was it roll bounce or was it no it wasn't roll bounce it was um whatever that movie she was she had with uh with, with, with bow wow what so whatever uh, I, I, I've been feeling making good for a very, very long time, and she is hotter and finer than she was. Uh, it's like she gets, you know, finer with, with age. Like, well, she kind of reminds me of Angela Bassett. But anyway... So, yeah, so Megan Good plays the estranged wife, and then, you know, he has a daughter, and then, you know, they're talking about they got to leave if he doesn't get enough money to help pay for the bills, yada, yada, yada. So he goes out and he hunts vampires. So, again, it is your typical vampire slash zombie fare, but, again, what makes it good is that, again, the action is top notch and again there's a scene with scott atkins and again if you guys don't know who scott atkins is you better just go into netflix and google his name and then you will know who scott atkins is but uh for those who don't know he is uh probably mostly famously known for playing snake eyes in the gi joe uh movies that uh used to that had came out a while ago so again he is a phenomenal martial artist and there's this scene where they're clearing out this house of uh, vampires and him and his brother are um and jamie fox and his partner are like clearing this house out and the action scene is just absolutely incredible like one of the best action scenes i've seen so far this year so again again i won't spoil it too much but again day shift is definitely worth a watch and it is on netflix uh currently 
The other movie that I watched uh, this weekend was called uh, Black Black Phone, and it's a horror film, and it's by the people who made Sinister, one of the scariest fucking scary movies that I've ever seen in the last decade. Uh, I, I, to this day, Sinister, I, I still remember when me and my wife would go see that movie in theaters, and it scared the living shit out of us. Like, I, I'll never forget the scene in particular where the guy was, pro- was sitting in a chair, and a little demon thing, like, popped up out of the blue, like, right behind his head, like, gave me heart palpitations. But anyway, this isn't about Sinister. This is about uh, the Black Phone. And the Black Phone is basically set in the 80s, or like the, the, the 70s, and it is about a small town that is having an issue with kids being kidnapped and they're all the boys and they're being kidnapped by this guy and um and then there's this uh the main protagonist of this is a 13 year old boy who also gets uh kidnapped but as he's kidnapped he is basically getting help from the people that were kidnapped before that ended up dying so again, I won't get into it too much because again, it, it has a nice lot of, of amount of twists and turns. And again, it's a really good movie. It kept me on the edge of my seat. And again, I definitely think the premise is brand new and it is very, very good. And uh, again, I, I definitely think you guys should check it out. Again, the, the best part of that film is actually the camaraderie between the main protagonist and his sister, who is basically the co-lead of the movie as well. Uh, and the sister has some gifts that kind of help her out in the... Uh, in the story so yeah so two movie reviews uh black phone and uh day shift uh definitely check them out if you get an opportunity again you will not go wrong because again show enough has said so all right <laughs> so the other thing i want to talk about which is probably going to be a little bit more controversial is uh she hulk so she hulk premiered on uh disney plus this uh past week on wednesday and i want to talk about it I, 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 so first things first And I want to say this, that uh, my overall thoughts on the actual show is is that I like it. Um, I thought the CGI in the first episode was solid. Uh, I liked that it was an origin story giving us, you know, a pretty solid reason as to why uh, She-Hulk is around. Now, again, I know they didn't go with the comic accurate version of how she uh, was created, but again, it still had all the same plot points that you would see from the old TV show and from the comics. Again, essentially what happened was uh, Bruce uh, was driving around with his cousin, who we never heard of before in the MCU, but again, she exists, so they were on vacation, and then a uh, a plane from Sakaar just showed up on planet Earth out of the blue causes an accident and then Bruce is wearing this device that uh, was fixing his arm um, from when he was holding the Infinity Gauntlet and the blood gets into her skin and she turns into the She-Hulk and boom, the rest is history. So uh, again, overall, like I said, um, I like that it wasn't too ha-ha comedy funny, even though it's supposed to be a television show. Uh, the best thing, the best way to describe it is it reminds me of Ally McBeal. And again, that was a show that used to come on in Fox where it was kind of like a breaking the uh, the fourth wall and kind of talking to the audience and then kind of having like these over the top like comedic moments. It was a really good show. Like I used to watch Ally McBeal back in the day and I loved that show. And She-Hulk gave me that Ally McBeal feel. So um, again, I it's only the first episode, so we haven't actually seen too much, uh, but it'll be interesting to see where they go from there. Now... The other thing that I liked about it is uh, Tatiana Muslani. uh, She is the actress who plays She-Hulk. And I used to watch Orphan Black. And again, Orphan Black was an incredible show. And she played the role of like all these other clones. And it was like dozens and dozens of clones. And the way that she was able to transition and to play those characters and have make you feel as a person watching the show that she's a completely different person each time she's playing these roles is just nothing short of amazing and brilliant. So again, you know, they got the right actress. Again, the CGI was solid. Uh, the only um, issue that I had was there was the, is the writing. And again, Hollywood is, is just really pushing my buttons with their, you know, with their, 
I don't even know the right word to use for it, but again, they're, they're just certain little things that was really irking me about the story. And again, it has nothing to do with the acting, and it has nothing to do with the CGI. It was just like, so, essentially, the first episode is, again, is, is uh, her origin story. You know, Hulk takes her to Mexico, you know, he's teaching her how to be a Hulk, and, you know, she's just throwing out these, like, little snide remarks about how she's better at a being a Hulk, and, I mean, you've been a Hulk for all of a week, and you're already talking about how you do everything better. It's just these little slight little digs that she's doing to Bruce, and it just really annoyed me, and it, and it, it rubbed me the wrong way, because I'm just like, uh, Hollywood has this thing where the only way they know how to write a female character is by bashing the character that she's a derivative of because it's already bad enough that i'm not a real huge fan of derivative characters and what i mean by that is is that if you got superman you gotta have superwoman or supergirl if you have batman you gotta have batwoman or if you have wonder woman you gotta have wonder man or wonder girl or whatever like i'm not a huge fan of derivative characters and again like even though i enjoy she hulk as a whole uh, again, like the way that they did her on television, like again, I, I'm not liking her snarkiness. Like there was this uh, scene that she has in the in the show where she's talking about controlling her anger. And again, let's keep in mind that Bruce has been Hulk and has had split personalities for over a decade, almost two decades. Right? He's been living with this for a very long time. So if anybody knew how to control his emotions and got and earned that right to be able to say that he can control his emotions, namely his anger, it would be Bruce. But when you're when you're hearing about it coming from She-Hulk and you know Jen or I guess that's her name in the show, she's using like the tried and true oh because I've been catcalled or because I've dealt with incompetent people who treated me a certain way because I'm a woman, I know all about, you know, uh, controlling my anger and I can do it better than you or better than a man. And I'm like, it, it really rubbed me the wrong way. It was more of an eye rolling moment. Like at its core, I kind of understood what she was trying to say. What I did not enjoy is that she was trying to say it at the expense of Bruce, somebody who has actually dealt with these issues, who's had people that he had lost because of him being the Hulk. The fact that he's killed people because of his anger issues. Like, again, like, the fact that she tried to compare her being catcalled and being a woman in a man's world to what Hulk had been going through, it really rubbed me the wrong way. And again, I wasn't the only one. Again, I was watching other videos of people talking about it. But again, the problem is, is that in this uh, social media world that we live in right now, if you say anything that hints that you're anti-woman or you're going against the grain, then you'll be canceled. But again, I don't give a crap about it. Again, like I said, overall, I still like the show. And just those few moments, uh, I, I just was not a fan of it. Again, you know, they were purposely. And again, it was the, the other little things that people are not noticing was that it was her turning it into a competition. Like, you know, Hulk would throw a rocket and she'd be like, oh, I threw the rock further than you because I'm stronger than you and da 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 which in turn is like, oh, okay. And then rock, then Hulk ends up throwing a rock and he throws it out of the stratosphere. And, and again, it's like, he didn't do that. It, it was her, it was Jen who was egging him on and trying to make this into a competition where she's the better Hulk and she does everything better. So again, like, again, I'm, I'm not a fan of how Hollywood always feels like the only way to make the derivative character better is by showcasing how much better they are against the main person. We already know that you guys have been already uh, downplaying Hulk for like the last couple of years. We already know that you guys have been basically uh, bitching out Hulk for the longest time. We don't need you to, get to keep reminding us with it with, with Jen. And again, people don't like to believe me when, when I say stuff like this. And um, even though, and, and I've, I pulled up a quick, uh, a quick example because um, the most recent one that, that really got to me was uh, the Batwoman show that was on CW. So in the Batwoman show, you know, uh, we had uh, Ruby Rose who came out and, you know, she came over because Batman abandoned Gotham and then she had to be the one that came back. And that show I really did not like. I gave it a, sh I gave it a shot. I watched like the first three or four episodes. It just wasn't for me. And then when the other actress that took over, which was the black Batwoman, uh, again, that one didn't really uh, work for me either, and I ended up not even um, finishing the show again, which was a shame because again, it was, it it, it had the potential to be uh, better, but again, it just kind of fell into those same tropes that even Super Supergirl ended up falling into. But so again, the the issue that I have is kind of like how, in order for her 
to prove that she is good enough to be Batman, she has to to bash the original Batman. And here's the prime example that we got from the first trailer. The first trailer. So so let's let's take a listen. I need you to fix his suit. The suit is literal perfection. It will be when it fits a woman. You see what I'm saying? Like, why was that necessary? Like, that should, it, it just, it's like, bleh, like, it, uh, it, like, why would you have to say that? Like, again, you go into this, you sneak into the Batcave, and we got Black Alfred with his little nerdy glasses on, and, and again, he's like, you know, uh, she finds the bat suit and she sees it, and she was like, I need you to make some changes. And he's like, what are you talking about? This suit is perfect. He's like, shh, it'll be perfect when it fits a woman. I'm like, come the fuck on. So yeah, that was, those are just the kind of examples that I wanted to kind of talk about when when we talk about like I, w I really wish Hollywood would figure out a way to write female characters and make them seem believable and make them seem legit without having to downgrade or blast the character that preceded them. You know what I mean? So it's it's just like and we got the same thing that happened with uh, Captain Marvel or Miss Marvel. I'm sorry, Captain Marvel, where you know they were like Captain Marvel, the strongest Avenger, and you know even on the press tours, you know we had you know her walking out talking about oh I'm stronger than Thor and I'm this and this and that. You can even see the. The, the cast members are all kind of like cringing, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah give me a damn stage. Anyway, uh, this ain't about, this ain't about that. So, so overall, though, that was just probably like my small gripes. But if I'm looking at the, oh, 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 there was other one other thing that I didn't like about the show. It's like right at the end, there's like a scene where she's uh, f uh, in the courtroom and she's getting ready to do a trial. And then this random ass generic villain just popped up out of nowhere and decided to attack the uh, the the trial. And you know, uh, Jen's friends like, "Oh, go ahead, do your thing." And she kind of like, "All right." And then she changes into She Hulk and then just beats the villain. And the episode ends, and I'm just kind of like, "What the fuck was that?" I, I don't understand the purpose of that, but okay, that's that's cool. But yeah, but uh, other than that, I like the show. Like. <laughs> I guess from from if you just listen to me going to tirade for the last five minutes, you would almost assume that I actually hate the show. But no, I don't actually hate the show. I thought I thought it, was, it actually had a lot going for it. I just I really just hope that the next couple of episodes, now that they don't have uh, Bruce to kind of push the narrative forward, and it is going to really truly be Jen's show, that you know we actually get to the meat and potatoes of what makes the show a good show. But again, like from the perspective of the first episode that I watched, I didn't have any really, really like glaring issues that made me not want to watch it other than a couple of cringy moments. So, yeah, there's that. So, um, um, honestly, I th oh, 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 so yeah, so that's going to be it for the random nerd news. You know, again, I've talked about things that are not related to uh, music, anime and gaming. So I do think it is time that we officially... Uh, transition uh, into uh, talking about some uh, PlayStation news. So yes, let's talk about it. So I found an article and I thought it was very interesting where it said that PlayStation is allegedly paying paying uh, developers and companies to block games from Game Pass. And this actually comes from Xbox legal firm that just made these statements. Now, again, if you guys have been living under a rock, if you guys didn't already know, uh, PlayStation, I mean, not PlayStation, Microsoft acquired Activision. It was a landmark case. They, you know, they bought Activision and again with Activision ended up coming with all their games and IP namely Call of Duty and again I don't care if you like Call of Duty if you hate Call of Duty everybody knows that Call of Duty is the biggest gaming franchise on the planet no matter how many games it comes out with they make money hand over fist it is the biggest video game franchise there is and it has always been the biggest franchise that there is the microtransactions the skins all that stuff it is unrivaled by any other first-person shooter or, or video game, in, in, in my opinion, and the, the data shows that. So, uh, Xbox already came out, Microsoft already came out and said, hey, you know, even though we are only 
contracted to give PlayStation the next three Call of Duty games, we don't have any intention of preventing the PlayStation groups from, you know, having access to the Call of Duty games. Like, we will have an ongoing relationship with you guys. You guys are more than welcome to have access to the uh, Call of Duty franchise. And I, got, I thought that was very benevolent of uh, PlayStation, I'm sorry, on uh, Microsoft, because if, if that were me, I probably would have been a little bit more petty, and I'd have been like, nah, y'all gonna have, y'all, this is a, uh, Call of Duty is a, a Xbox exclusive now, y'all, y'all can't get it at all, like, you see what I'm saying, like, but no, Microsoft, no, and, and I'm joking, because, let me be clear, uh, for the longest time, PlayStation had the bigger player base. And again, at the end of the day, this is not about a console war. Microsoft is not in a console war business. They are in the business of making money. And the best way to continue to make money is to be able to make it so that uh, PlayStation fan base can also access Call of Duty. It, it just That would be stupid for them to make it a, a, um, a Microsoft exclusive. It, it, it just is not good business. So now, now with that, Xbox is also doing other good things, and which is namely Game Pass. And again, I've been talking to my friends about it. I've been talking to my friends, uh, Chris and Ghost. You know, I've been telling them that for the longest time that Game Pass is the best value in gaming, bar none. The ability to pay twenty dollars a month and have access to a entire vault of old games and new games, any first party game that comes out from Xbox, you can get it on Game Pass. Plus, they get other exclusives on Game Pass that are not anywhere else in the business. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and um, pull up real quick and just give you guys some of the titles. So, again, I wanted to quickly just go over some of the Game Pass games that they have on there. Again, the, the most recent uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Re um, Revenge game that came out, you had to pay like 30 40 bucks for that on PlayStation, on Game Pass. It's included, you know, Aliens, Fireteam Elite, Halo Infinite, you know, Marvel's Avengers, the Among Us game, again, uh, Outriders, Minecraft, Wasteland, State of Decay, um, Tell Me Why, you know, just the y Yakuza, Last Dragon, uh, Dragon Quest, Dusk Falls, like, I'm just going through the list of, you know, Game Pass games, and you guys are looking at it on video you'll be seeing the uh, games that i'm showing but again game pass just has a great list of video games and again playstation cannot compete with that because they even because of game pass they had to try to come up and come out and revamp their own services that they were um using because again it wasn't up to snuff to what game pass was providing so and the other thing about game pass that people don't really understand is that with Game Pass, you can play Game Pass anywhere. Like, I can play Game Pass on my phone. Like, what I, basically, Game Pass enables you to have multiple Xboxes. So, I, I'll give you guys a prime example of what a scenario on how I use Game Pass in two particular ways. So, I have a uh, 4K USB uh, uh, hub. So, what I do is it's a 4K stick, and you plug it into any TV, and then it has two other cores that it connects to. It has a USB-C that can plug into your phone or any other device that contains USB-C, and then it has a USB that you can use for power, and it basically turns your phone into a portable TV anywhere you want to go. So uh, last year, well, this year, early this year, I, you know, me and my family went on a trip to Florida. I wanted to play my Xbox. This was right around the time when um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge came out, and I literally took my phone, took that cord, plugged it in and then turned on game pass on my phone and i was and i had my little portable xbox controller and i was able to connect to my phone with the xbox controller and you literally use that as an xbox and i was able to play my xbox from florida on my phone all any game pass games i was even able to remote into my xbox from florida and play it it's 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 ingenious and again that's all included in game pass also, again, if you guys are only watching the um, the video only version, I'm show, I'm holding up my um, Valve Steam Deck. Again, the Valve Steam Deck can play Game Pass. So you know how Game Pass has Game Pass PC. You can use that on your Steam Deck. So again, another portable way, 4K device that I can use to play uh to play Game Pass on it. Again, it's the best value in gaming, hands down. But the whole point of that is just saying that, again, PlayStation doesn't like that. So uh, let's get into this story. So uh, 
it says here that uh, it says VGC reports that Xbox parent company Microsoft recently filed a document to Brazil's Administrative Council for Economic Defense that includes claims that Sony is paying third party developers not to add their games to Xbox Game Pass or any other uh, competing service in the forms of blocking fees. Again, according to the statement, Microsoft accuses Sony of fearing Game Pass innovative business model that offers high quality content at a low cost to the gamers, which they say threatens that threatens a leadership that has been um, forged in a device centric and exclusivity focused strategy over the years. And again, basically what they're trying to say is, is that for so long, Sony has thrived on the business model of we are the only place where you can play this game. And again, look, to be fair, Microsoft has done that as well. But again, I would say that for, and again, I told my friends this as well. I was like, Microsoft is no longer doing the console wars. Console wars is over. Like, so Microsoft does not care about who sells the most systems. Right now, all they care about is, is how many people we can get signed up for Game Pass. They have moved on from consoles and they don't care if you played on their console, if you played on PC, if you played on a cell phone, if you played on a Steam Deck. As long as you are you have that Game Pass service, that is all they care about. And right now, I believe the number says that uh, Game Pass has over 25 million um, concurrent users right now, which is incredible. So Xbox, I mean, Sony doesn't like that. Sony wants to continue the the the, uh, the, the, the console wars. They want to keep things in the past because, again, that's kind of how things have always worked. So that's how they want to keep things going. So to me, it doesn't surprise me in the slightest that Sony is uh, definitely afraid of what Game Pass is doing because it does provide such a value for the consumer. And again, I've already said, even with game, with uh, Sony's version of Game Pass, it doesn't hold a candle to Microsoft's Game Pass. And you don't hear people talking about it at all. Like again, they give you a couple of free games here and there, but you're not, not even getting the first party titles. You're not getting the God of War 2s or the, you know, the, the Last of Us 2 or any of those kind of games. You're not getting those kind of caliber of games Whereas with Microsoft, they don't they don't care. They're like any first party party game that comes out, you get a day one with Game Pass. And again, you cannot beat that. You just can't. And um, to and, and on top of that, I, I definitely think that um, because it also came out too that Sony was trying to uh, block the Activision um, um, acquisition from um, Microsoft because again again they are so afraid of losing Call of Duty because again Call of Duty is such a huge grip on the actual gaming market is that if it goes exclusively to microsoft even if it's on sony playstation that is basically putting it into the pockets as you know uh no matter how much it sells on playstation xbox is going to get a cut of that so like say if there's like hundreds of millions of people that are playing on um playstation that money's going to ultimately go to um microsoft because again they own activision so it's just as simple as that so so all in all i i, I definitely think that uh Sony is afraid. Again, I don't think this is one of those situations where I'm like, oh, Sony's going to die and, you know, PlayStation's going to, um, you know, fade into obscurity. I don't think that's going to happen at all. But I definitely think that their business model is being challenged and they do not like the fact that Microsoft is being so consumer friendly right now. Uh, but if I'm being honest, like, you know, when the next Modern Warfare comes out, um, I'm definitely going to be probably playing it on PlayStation anyway. Because, again, um, they are still getting the exclusive. I do believe that the campaign, you can play it first on PlayStation. So, um, and again, for me, uh, Modern Warfare is my bread and butter. So Modern Warfare 2, I will 1000% be playing that thing day one. And um, if the exclusives are still on PlayStation, that's probably where I'm gonna be playing it. So yeah, that's uh, kind of like where we are there. Now, again, like I said, I'm pretty sure there are gonna be people who disagree with me, but uh, again, it, it is what it is. So, again, that is it for uh, gaming news. Again, I just kind of wanted to touch base on that. Now it, it is time to kind of jump in on the anime manga side and, you know, just kind of, you know, jump into that. So, without further ado, let us get into anime news. Alright, so we are back. Let us talk about some Dragon Ball. You guys know, I talked about Dragon Ball last week and I get to talk about it again. You know, I'm just feeling myself. It's like, it's over 9,000! 
Yeah, so it's 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 good. It's good. So Dragon Ball Superhero has shattered expectations by getting a twenty point one million dollar de- debut this weekend. I mean, God damn, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. I mean, I, I got I got to give it up. I got to give it up to to uh, to to Dragon Ball again. I know it's it's just beautiful, man. It's just beautiful. So. What happened was that uh, this weekend, again, like I said, and in, in spite of the fact that this movie was not only leaked months ago, again, because I'm, I'm, I may have watched the, the leaked movie, but it was the, the subversion leaked months ago. So the fact that this movie was able to make $20 million, which in fact is now the highest grossing uh, animated movie from like, you know, anime of all time and that is it's been like 15 years since anybody has ever had that record and that was held by pokemon the first movie mewtwo strikes back which was uh 33 years ago and i remember pokemon the first movie because i saw pokemon the first movie in theaters that weekend and uh it actually destroyed the last dragon ball movie that came out which was dragon ball super broly which had a $9.8 million opening weekend. So Dragon Ball Superhero that had Gohan and it had Piccolo as the main characters, not even Goku and Vegeta, more than doubled the information from um, the, the movie from last year, which was Dragon Ball Super Broly. So I, again, I'm just like, <laughs> congratulations, guys. Well, well-deserved, well-deserved and well-earned. And I also honestly think that that is something that's going to resonate with the people overseas to kind of understand that, uh, you know, Japan is not the only place where you can make a lot of good money off of anime that you can. If it's if it's something that's embraced by the fan base, we will support those movies as well. And you guys can make a lot of money over here as well. So maybe, uh, you know, the, the, the fans over here in the States will get a little bit more respect when it comes to uh, anime, because again, we I do feel like, you know, we don't get a lot of respect because again, and, and understandably, because to be quite honest with you, uh, there's a lot of times where, you know, we on that bullshit, so we don't deserve the uh, the anime that we get to watch and consume. But anyway, this, ain't, this is not about that. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about was um, Dragon Ball Super, uh, manga. So manga chapter came out, you know, Dragon Ball Super, the manga that gets covered uh, monthly. So chapter 87 just came out and it has some huge uh, revelations that kind of split the fan base and pissed everybody off. And again, this is that thing that I talk about, especially on TikTok, anime and manga TikTok is just so toxic. And again, there's so many people that hate Dragon Ball because it's so popular, but they don't understand that no matter what you say, Dragon Ball will always be the GOAT. And again, I think this movie just proved that in spades. Now, Dragon Ball Super uh, Chapter 87 was the conclusion of the um, uh, of the of the fight between Goku, Vegeta, and Gas from the Heaters. And it was also uh, Granola was also the basically the whole Granola saga. So what ends up happening is, is that, you know, Goku is in Ultra Instinct and Vegeta is in Ultra Ego and the battle is done. They ended up fighting Gas and Gas, you know, he's like his body's breaking down because Gas made a wish that made him the strongest in the universe. But in order to do that, he had to use his life force in order to achieve that power. So, again, he is on the verge of death. And then to make a long story short, Frieza shows up. And basically one shots gas, killing him, and then proceeds to transform into his new form, which is basically called Frieza Black. <laughs> or nigga Frieza. <laughs> so it's 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 kind of like he became the person that he hated the most. <laughs> so again, he comes in, he one shots Goku and Vegeta at the same time, plus kills gas, and then just decides to leave, and then that's pretty much the end of the arc. So everybody was all up in arms and they're like, you know, this is an ass pool. Like, how does Frieza get that strong? And again, this is what I'm talking about. Dragon Ball sucks. Dragon Ball doesn't have a good story. Dragon Ball doesn't have good plot. Dragon Ball sucks. Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball. And again, it just frustrates me because I'm like, 
while I agree with you that Dragon Ball does not have these like crazy in-depth storylines that you would see in like a Demon Slayer or Jujutsu Kaisen or My Hero Academia where they're talking about quirks and quirk evolutions and shit like that. It might not have all that, but again, at its core, Dragon Ball still has a story and the story always has an interconnected pieces to it. And I'm going to explain what I'm talking about. So... Again, one of the things that people were talking about is how this was an ass pull on Frieza's part, and I'm explaining why it's not. So, Exhibit A, if you go back to Resurrection F, where this all kind of started, because again, we all know Frieza was killed by Trunks, and he had been gone since then, but then in Resurrection F, he was uh, brought back to life, he came back, and he achieved his golden form, which basically put him on the same level as a god, but again, we already knew that he had only been training for like, uh, what was it, six months or six weeks or something to that, I think it was like six months he was training in order for him to achieve the gold form and then basically become a god, but because he trained himself, achieved that form, and then sh went straight to earth, he ended up not being able to control the power for very long, and that's how he ended up losing. Again, he ended up going into the um, the next movie, which was Dragon Ball Super Hero, I mean, Dragon Ball Super Broly. And again, we all saw how Frieza got mollywopped by Broly for like two, like an hour. Like for like an hour straight, he was getting his ass whooped by Broly. And at the end of that movie, if you watch the movie, and you see where Frieza says that I will never suffer this kind of insults ever again, and he leaves. And then at the very end of the movie, you see Frieza going back to his old ways and you see him destroying these planets and he's on this planet with his Frieza force destroying shit. That's a very important thing. And this was in Dragon Ball Super, the movie Broly. Keep that in mind. So then we have Frieza show up on this planet again. He one shots Gas, he one shots Goku and Vegeta. And he tells him that I achieved this new form, which is Goku, I mean, which is Frieza Black. And he explains that he achieved this form by finding a, uh, a dip in the uh, space-time continuum. Basically, finding a, a room of spirit and time like they used to use on Comics Lookout in Planet Earth. So apparently on that same planet that Frieza was invading at the end of Dragon Ball Broly, he finds a spirit and time room and is training there for 10 years years so of course in 10 years in that time frame is 10 months which is why he was able it's very believable that he's supposed to get that strong and the reason why i say that is because it is already explained in dragon ball um resurrection f that frieza is a prodigy like when goku first turned super saiyan and all this other stuff and he was fighting uh frieza at his 100 percent Frieza wasn't trying. What I mean by that is, is that Frieza has always been that strong. He was just born that strong. Imagine that. Imagine all the training that Goku had been doing up until that point when he fought Frieza for the first time on Namek. At that point in time, Frieza had never trained a day in his life. He was just always that strong. So he even said to himself, he was like, imagine what would happen if I actually applied myself and trained and that's how he was able to go from barely being able to beat a Super Saiyan Trunks to being able to match up to gods after training for six months. So imagine how strong he would be now at after training for 10 years in a room of spirit and time. Incredibly strong. And you guys can't call it an ass pull because guess what? Every fucking Z fighter has also done that in the show in Dragon Ball Z. Vegeta has done it. Trunks has done it. Goten has done it. Piccolo has done it. Goku and Gohan has done it. How do you think that both of them was able to get to Super Saiyan 2? So you guys can't call it an ass pull by Frieza training in the room of spirit and time because the other characters have done it as well. It's very simple. So that's exactly why I don't think it's an ass pull for Frieza to get this new mode. Now, here's where I will give you guys a little bit of credence, a little bit of uh, credit. Do I think that the transformation is sloppy? Absolutely. I, for one, am not an apologist when it comes to uh, Kira Toriyama's ideas and visions for transformations. When I first saw Goku's red-haired uh, Super Saiyan God transformation, I was thoroughly disappointed because I'm one of those people who love, love, love Super Saiyan 4, and I think still to this day that Super Saiyan 4 is Goku's best transformation outside of the original Super Saiyan. But... 
I am also not one of those people who are a super huge fan of color swaps. Super Saiyan God, red. Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan, blue. Ultra Instinct, Omen, black, with a little uh, key sheen. Uh, Ultra Instinct, silver hair with a key sheen. And then now you got uh, Vegeta with uh, Ultra Ego, which is kind of like a purple hair, and he loses his eyebrows, kind of like Super Saiyan 3. Like, to me, those are technically lazy transformations, if you want to call it that. And the same thing would apply to Frieza. Again, you got regular Frieza, 100%, then you got Golden Frieza, and then now he just turns into Black Frieza. To me, I'm like, it is kind of lazy. But again, it's Dragon Ball. I've been watching Dragon Ball for 30, 40 plus years. That's kind of what Dragon Ball is. You just got to suck it up. You have to dis You have to sometimes roll the punches. And you have to understand that you're going to get those kind of lazy transformations. It's not going to be like these little fan-made projects that people are doing. Sometimes it is what it is. So I'm not worried about it. I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not worried about it. So um, overall, like I said, it's a really good chapter. It makes sense. Again, I just say for you guys who are not happy with it, it's just hold on and just wait and see what happens in the in the future. Now, the only other thing I wanted to talk about this week is I wanted to talk about Bleach. Now, I didn't get to talk about this last week uh, because, again, I forgot about it and I ran out of time. But uh, Disney Plus, there was a rumor going around that said that Disney Plus had secured the exclusive rights to stream the new Bleach series, uh, Thousand Year Blood War, that's going to be premiering at the end of this year. And everybody was all up in arms, including myself, because I'm like, why the fuck would I want to watch Bleach on Disney Plus? Like when I think about watching anime, Disney is the last place that I think about wanting to consume anime. It just really is. And I'm like, if I'm going to consume anime, it's going to be on like Netflix or Crunchyroll. Crunchyroll primarily, and then I also I'm used to watching it on Netflix because again, when I think about Disney Plus, I think about censorship and them trying to be the house of mouse before giving quality to the show. Look at how much trouble they're giving people now about having to have a, a, a rated R Deadpool. So I'm like, I don't want to watch Bleach, which is very violent, to be on Disney Plus. But apparently that was just a false alarm and that there was no actual sources that came out and said that this was actually something that was happening. And if you actually go back and take a look at the actual research and see the other exclusive uh, animes that uh, Disney Plus currently hands, handles, it what they basically do is, is that because Crunchyroll is not available overseas, uh, where places like Disney Plus is, they are holding and they have exclusive rights to stream those certain shows for the people overseas. So even when I first heard about it, I was kind of like, I just don't see how Crunchyroll would not have Bleach. Like Bleach is like of the big three. Like that's like saying that uh, 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 Disney Plus had all the exclusive streaming rights to One Piece or to Naruto. Like to me, that just that just mind, it's mind boggling. Like I don't know how much money you would have to give in order to get a company to make it so that Disney Plus is the only place to stream that show when I'm pretty sure that Crunchyroll and uh, or netflix in general just kind of has more subscribers than disney plus and again a bigger audience that wants to watch anime than disney plus because if that were to happen i wouldn't watch it on disney plus i would just um stream it illegally because again i can stream any anime that i want illegally now i support country road because again i enjoy watching anime on an app that's like very secure and i can watch it wherever i want to watch it but if i had to stream uh bleach illegally don't and if it was on um disney plus I would do it in a heartbeat. Let me let me tell you, but um, yeah. So uh, I will keep you guys posted if anything does change in that aspect. But um, as according to like I said, from the sources and the information that I read, uh, that is not something that's going to happen. So um, yeah. Well, that's all we're going to have time for today. Again, thank you guys so much. Make sure you guys are uh, subscribed to the channel and make sure you follow me on the Magnet Podcast on Instagram and on Facebook at the Magnet Podcast. And you can check out all audio uh, podcasts on uh, magnetpodcast.libson.com. Uh, you can also find a video version of this podcast on my Showing Up the King YouTube channel. Uh, again, this is Showing Up the King, and I will see you guys next week with episode 25. Peace.